Thank you everybody again for joining us. Uh, very, very excited. Uh, for those of you who have just joined or for those of you who are not familiar with uh, who I am or who we are, uh, I'm the CEO of a company called MotiveBase. Uh, MotiveBase is a research technology company. We're all anthropologists and our task primarily uh, as we work with 130 plus organizations globally is to help in tasks at the front end of innovation in particular. Uh, but in particular, what we do is the study of culture and specifically the study of meaning. And we're going to spend the next hour decoding and talking about what is meaning, why is it so important, and how does in an anthropological lens, or as Jillian will describe it, how does anthrovision help you get there? Uh, so without further ado, I will pass the mic on to Jillian. Uh, Jillian would love to hear a little bit about your journey um, from anthropologist to journalist, just to uh, give people a sense of who you are and where you've been, and then we can dive into the subject matter at hand. Well, thank you very much indeed, Joel, and it's great to have a chance to talk to you and everyone watching about a subject which really is very dear to my heart um, I'm passionate about. Um, and you said I'm also an anthropologist as well as a journalist. Um, in fact, I'd always say I am completely an anthropologist, and that has very much driven and influenced the way I look at the world as a journalist. Um, my current day job is, as you say, I co-chair the editorial board for the Financial Times, looking at the Brains Trust, if you like, of the Financial Times globally. Um, until quite recently, I was running the editorial operations of the FT in the Americas. But I started my career as an anthropologist um, I did classic PhD in fieldwork in Tajikistan, which is the former Soviet Republic on the borders of Afghanistan, looking at the question of marriage rituals and Islamic identity and how that had or had not survived the communist um, Soviet state. And when I came out of that background, um, partly because there was a brutal war in the area I was doing my research and I became a war reporter by accident, um, when I came out of that background, I joined the FT. Um, I worked my way up the ranks of the FT through the economics room, being a foreign correspondent, working in Japan. By the time I got to meet the titans of Wall Street and Washington and then Silicon Valley and told them I had this start not in an MBA program or the economics department of university, but in anthropology, studying marriage rituals in Tajikistan, I'd often get them say to me, well, listen, that is just totally weird. Um, in fact, they said to me before 2007, a couple of them, that's just completely hippie. Um, you know, what is the point of looking at something like that when you're supposed to be a financial journalist writing about finance or big business? And what I now say with growing confidence after 2008 financial crisis and all the other weird things that have happened, including particularly the pandemic, is that actually anthropology is a brilliant training for looking at the world in any sphere. And just as anyone in business has learned that it pays to use a bit of psychology, say the works of Danny Kahneman to understand the world or to use a bit of neuroscience or to use economics because it's a very useful tool too, as anyone who's read free economics will know, it also really pays to use some anthropology, cultural anthropology, and it's tragic that the discipline has been so ignored and so neglected for so long, because it really is a hidden jewel of ideas. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that um, I often find myself talking about, especially when we meet a client or an organization for the first time, uh, is this notion of meaning. And, uh, you know, I was uh, particularly uh, excited about unpacking this with you today, uh, because you know, as much as um, we might in our day-to-day -day lives talk about artifacts that you know hold special meaning for us, maybe something our grandmother gave us, things like that, we don't actually take a step back to think about the fact that every little thing, every little word, every little idea, concept, trend also carries meaning with it. And perhaps the part that I find intrigues people the most when, when I bring it up uh, is the idea that meaning isn't fixed. And I sometimes remind them, you know, even if you look at a dictionary and you compare it 10 years ago to today, 
a lot of the definitions are evolving, although in the world of the dictionary, some of the definitions are evolving in a more nuanced manner. In the world of culture, you know, as an example, what health means to us in 2021 is different from what health meant to us in 2019. Uh, and to me and to our organization, what's interesting, what's fascinating it, with applying an anthropological lens is that, you know, I, I kind of walk around, I was, I was jokingly telling somebody, I, I walk around looking at the world like, uh, you know, this never ending web of meaning. It's like a cobweb that just never ends. There's no start, no finish. It's just everywhere. Uh, and when you start looking at the world that way, you realize, wow, there, you can see how this web of meaning is, is a moving um, sort of unshakable kind of constantly evolving entity. Uh, and I was curious to discuss that with you a little bit because uh, in the sneak peek that I got of your book, uh, I was really intrigued by you know, the, disc the, the, the discourse you had around tunnel versus lateral vision and, and how anthrovision could really help you know, kind of bring, um, bring insight in places where you, sometimes you don't think you'll find it. Uh, and I, I would love to hear some of your thoughts around that as well. Well, if I had a single phrase that I could tape to my computer, it would be that a fish can't see water, which is a Chinese proverb. And the key point is that, you know, we all are hardwired to assume that the environment we live in and all the assumptions we inherited from our surroundings are normal and natural and that other people are weird. And we also tend to assume that they're fixed. Um, and, you know, the reality is that neither of that is true. Um, everybody thinks that everyone else is weird and we're all equally weird. There's equal opportunity weirdness, if you like. And really a core principle of anthropology or the anthropological method is to try and do a three part process of immersing yourself in the minds of people who seem weird to you, different from you, to get empathy for another point of view. Um, and that actually is crucial for us all to do today in a globalized world where frankly we have a system that enables contagion to happen all the time, shocks to spread faster than our understanding of each other spreads as well. So getting empathy for the other is useful, but it was also useful because it enables you, the fish, to jump out of your water and look back at yourself and just see how weird you are and all the gaps in your life and all the things you ignore. And to then take the third step, which is to think about social silence, what you're not talking about. And social silences are critical um, for two reasons. Firstly, human beings don't live in just one dimension. They're three dimensional. Um, there are always layers of meaning and layers of ideas sort of overlapping, often in quite contradictory ways that we ignore a lot of the time. Um, you know, one of the examples I love to um, talk about, which I use in my book is say cooking um, or dog food. Take, let's take dog food first because I have a dog. Um, you know, if you ask people sort of, you know, what do they care about with dogs? Why do you think you're going to sell dog food? Or why would you buy dog food? People think, oh, it's all about the science of the dog. I want to make sure that the dog's got the best possible nutrition. And they kind of take dog food for granted. You know, it seems like, well, dog food's there. Of course, everyone has dogs. Um, the reality is that actually, for most of human history, dogs haven't been fed dog food. They were just fed whatever came around. Nobody has any way of knowing how to judge a good brand of dog food or a bad brand of dog food, because guess what? The dog can't speak. How do you tell whether Rover likes your dog food or not? Um, and on top of all that, there's a really interesting thing about how we imagine dogs, which is that today people almost take it for granted that dogs are part of the family and it's part of who they are and their identity. The reality is that in 99.9% .9 of cultures around the world, that has been complete anathema. Dogs inhabited a cultural category very different from human beings. And if you start digging about what's really going on with dog food and why we care for dogs, much of it's about enabling humans to talk to each other and to create their own ideal of a family in quite a customized 21st century way rather than anything to do with biology of dogs. And that nothing wrong with that, it's absolutely fine. But the point is this, 
There are numerous contradictory layers in terms of our attitudes towards dogs and dog food, which you can't just get from a survey. And you certainly can't get just from big data on what humans are doing or what the wretched dogs or the lovely dogs are doing. I have a dog, I love dogs, but still. Um, and that brings me to the other great point why these layers of meaning are contradictory, which is that so many of our tools today work on the premise, intellectual tools, that the past is a good guide to the future, whether it's economic models, whether it's big data sets, whether it's political polling. And most of them are bounded. You know, so basically the economic model has everything in the model, everything else is an externality. Big data set is whatever parameters you choose to track. Corporate balance sheet is defined. And everything else has been a footnote or an externality. And what we're seeing now is that the externalities are kind of big a matter like climate change or inequality or changing social attitudes. And we're also seeing that the context of these models is changing quite fast in a way that creates very nasty surprises if you have an excessively bounded vision of what's happening. And culture does change. And one other you know, example I use is, again, in my book, which is taps in totally to what you're saying about this concept of webs of meaning from Clifford Geertz, which is what's happened to something as humble as the Kit Kat bar globally. Started life as a totally British product. It came out of a company created by a Yorkshire Quaker in the late 19th century. Um, was branded as 100% British for years in Britain. You know, chocolate's brown, British people ate it, have a break, have a Kit Kat. Someone took it to Japan, was treated as a British exotic piece of British cuisine for a while. And then by a complete quirk, a group of teenagers in Kyushu, the Southern Island of Japan, in about the year 2000, noticed that the British word Kit Kat is the same or very similar to Japanese kitokatsu um, in the, in the um, Kyushu dialect variant of Japanese, meaning um, we will overcome. And they began to give the bar as a joke to each other during their high school exam period. Some very savvy local Japanese managers went, wow, let's use this. And they embarked on this subliminal marketing campaign. And within three years, it worked so well that Kit Kat had become not just a sort of good luck token, but a quasi religious good luck token. 50%, 50% of teenagers in Japan give or receive a Kit Kat as a good luck religious token now. So the meaning has completely changed in a way that no big data model could have ever forecast and probably no com com um, consumer poll or survey could have possibly spotted a few years ago either. Yeah, that's that's a phenomenal example. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of things you said there, Julian, that um, you know, that, that I would I would love to unpack a, a bit further. One of it, and I think you know, this is a this is a, a fascinating idea that um, a lot of folks, especially in corporate research and in corporate innovation, don't quite uh, take a step back to think about which is that you, know, you ask a human being, you ask a consumer about something, the response you get uh, tends to be uh, somewhat logical, uh, somewhat framed up. And in the process of trying to make sense of that question and answer that, uh, whatever that question is, uh, the human being is actually going through probably thousands of processes in their brain where they're actually choosing to not talk about a ton of the meanings they associate with that one idea. For example, you ask somebody, what does gut health mean to you? And somebody says, oh, this is about digestion. In that process, they have tried to answer that question as logically as they could, but they didn't mention the fact that they also think it could potentially help them prevent cancer. They have no proof of that. They don't wanna sound silly in the moment, but they think that's what it is. They also don't wanna mention the fact that they think this has something to do with helping them maintain healthy weight throughout their lifetime. They also don't want to mention the fact that uh, maybe this will clear up their skin or their acne or what have you. Uh, it doesn't matter whether there is scientific evidence validating these claims. It doesn't matter whether there's tons of uh, peer-reviewed research showing these claims. What we find fascinating is the fact that 
these meanings exist. Oftentimes they're, to your point, they're contradictory, they're illogical, uh, yet they exist in people's minds. But the moment we rely on a single response to a question, an idea, um, we miss a majority of the equation. And, and you know, there's an, there's an experiment we ran, Jillian, in the early stages of starting our company, uh, because we study meaning, but we study meaning with extremely large volumes of data. And, you know, exactly to your point, we didn't want to use big data for the sake of it. We wanted to use big data because it allowed us to build and model this web of meaning. You know, we kind of envisioned this as if it was a, a, a solar system where, uh, I'm gonna butcher physics here, but as if it's many solar systems within a galaxy and everything is interconnected with one another, everything is related, everything puts pressure on one another, there's constant movement and change and evolution. And we thought, you know, how awesome would it be to build a system where we can actually track and model this and when we were doing that, the initial experiments we ran, we would look at a verbatim from a consumer, from a human being online that, you know, let's say they're talking about gut health, they would say something. And we, we look at what kind of meaning they're communicating, typically one set of logical meanings communicated in, in an idea, in a, in a post. And we'd compare that with all the data we're seeing uh, where a lot of the meaning is actually indirectly related, but contextual. And we'd find that in every single benchmarking exercise we ran, if you looked at a handful of, let's say a hundred responses from a survey, from um, some social media posts, you'd capture less than a percent of what something actually meant in culture. Uh, and oftentimes you'd capture an idea that was in the past, never an idea that was into the future. And this was something that was just fascinating to us because, um, you know, obviously, you know, as, as you know, and, and um, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners know, there, it, there are, there's so much research out there from early linguists to uh, early philosophers and, and uh, anthropologists who've done a ton of research showing and proving exactly this. But I think a lot of the times we forget about this, and we're surprised when we see that the thing we do, for example, if we're in the organic food industry, we're surprised when we see contradictory evidence, contradictory meanings about the value of organic food, let's say to the environment, as well as the problems uh, with organic food for the environment and so on. Um, and I think, the, I think the greatest challenge before uh, any organization of any, any size uh, is to get comfortable with the contradiction because that is culture. Um, and, and that's the part that I think we, we tend to talk a lot about and we're actually spending more and more time with our clients to do exactly that uh, because we wanna create that comfort uh, to, to just realize that you're not going to get a world where everything is logical and straightforward. If it was, I mean, all our lives would be so much simpler. But I think in some ways, you know, I think actually we are at an interesting zeitgeist shift right now because I think that um, shift is occurring or that recognition is, is spreading, even if people don't articulate it, it very clearly. And one way to understand that is to look at the rise of the sustainability movement, where in a sense, what's happened when people embrace environmental social governance, you know, sometimes they're doing so because they wanna actively change the world. More often they're doing so because of risk management reasons. They realize that if they ignore issues like the climate or inequality, or racial justice, either in their own companies or their supply chains, it can come back to bite them in all kinds of ways. Um, and if you tease apart what's really going on with things like environmental social governance, ESG, you're basically moving from a tunnel vision world to lateral vision, a world where people are saying, you know what, we spent decades in the 20th century just focusing on profit loss balance sheets, just focusing on, focusing on economic models. And now we realize actually all these externalities and footnotes really matter. We need a bigger vision of how the world is now going. And so I think that particularly millennials almost instinctively recognize that this concept of just swimming in your lane or just thinking they're a neat single 
solution to things is rather naive. You know, you need to recognize there's ambiguity and complexity. Um, the terrible irony is, of course, is that computers are very badly designed to handle um, complexity, contradiction, um, you know, when it comes to creating these big models. Um, I often joke that in a world increasingly dominated by AI, artificial intelligence, we need a second type of AI, anthropology intelligence. And the last point I make on this issue is that I'm not ever rejecting the value of economic models, big data sets, corporate balance sheets. These are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant tools. In fact, they're brilliant compasses often to tell you which direction to go in. But the image I use is that it's like walking through a dark wood at night with a compass. And you can have the best compass in the world that's brilliant and you don't want to throw it away. It's useful, incredibly useful. But if you walk through the wood, just looking down with your eyes fixed on the compass alone all the time, you will walk into a tree and bang your head. And what anthropology does at its best is enable you to lift up your eyes look around the wood and realize the context in which you're operating and how that's shifting. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, exactly to your point about um, AI, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we, we sort of semi-jokingly uh, talk about is the fact that um, for us, AI is, is more about CI and, and we use the term contextual intelligence, which is, um, it, which is, you know, kind of falls in line with what you were talking about in the sense that we realized that in order to model meaning, um, we had to model uh, the same way uh, a human anthropologist might be observing a group of people, let's say around the dinner table, talking about an idea or a topic. Uh, and I would often use this example in the early days, even with our chief technology officer, I would often use this example of saying, you know, let's say we're around the dinner table and people are talking about buying more sustainably. And, you know, let's say, you know, Jillian starts the conversation, talks about buying more sustainably, and there are five other people around the dinner table. They continue the conversation as the human anthropologist observing them. I know they're speaking in context, even if they never use the words sustainable, sustainability, any of the synonyms. I know they're speaking in context because one of them is talking about buying a certain type of toothbrush or avoiding single use plastics or what have you. But the, 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 the magical part about that experience is that as the human anthropologist, I am absorbing the innate nature in which this group of five or six people are giving meaning to this notion of sustainability or buying sustainably. And we realized that we had a huge problem when we were building our technology. We had to teach our technology to understand context in the same way. And the question became, how do we do that? Because if we just scrape data like everybody else is through the lens of topics, so if we just scrape anything people are talking about where they mention sustainable or I don't know, 15 other synonyms of that, that wouldn't be sufficient because we would be missing a large part of the conversation that was had in context where meaning was created. Uh, and uh, we did some math on it and we discovered that in a typical conversation that flows from start to finish, about 75% of the discourse never uses the original terms or any of its synonyms, but is yet in context. So, you know, the conversation that started about sustainability, 75% of the responses are still in context, are about sustainability, yet they never use those words. And so the hardest part became for us, we realized we're not building some, uh, some AI engine that, you know, supposedly re replaces human beings. No, we're building an engine that can understand context and crunch massive amounts of data so that our, so that our human anthropologists can do their jobs better. Uh, so that the researchers on our client side can do their jobs better. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's really what you need right now is a combination of social and computer science and yeah. probably economic science and medical science all put together. I mean, what better example of the need to put um, hard science into context with social science um, than the recent pandemic, where it became very clear 
that you couldn't solve a pandemic, you couldn't fix a pandemic just with brilliant medicine. You need brilliant medicine, but you can have the best me medicine in the world and the best medical understanding in the world. But if people don't behave the right way during a pandemic, it will spread. And if you don't understand why they're behaving in contradictory ways, it will spread. And if you can't understand people's attitudes towards vaccines, you know, good luck in trying to beat a, a pandemic. You need both. Um, and we need to learn from each other and other contexts beyond just our own backyard. I mean, the tragedy of the pandemic is that there were so many lessons from Asia and West Africa. And again, I write about this in my book, which could and should have been learned. Um, and masks, for example, a classic example where you have contradictory meanings and meanings change, to come back to your point. You know, until two years ago, the idea of wearing a face mask was something which you really only had in Asia during a pandemic. Um, and people have looked at what had happened in Asia with pandemics from a medical perspective and said it helped. But it was actually sociologists who studied mask culture during things like the SARS pandemic who pointed out that actually a lot of the main benefit of masks in a pandemic is not medical. It's actually a very useful psychological signaling device to tell the population that they need to modify their behavior and a cultural symbol or flag showing adherence to group norms and that we're all in this together with shared social responsibility. Um, so they think that actually the reason masks were in Asia were as much because of those behavioral modification issues as actually physically stopping germs. I mean, it's not either or, they both work. But then you fast forward to the pandemic in America and I wrote a column in the spring of that almost exactly a year ago, sitting in New York, pointing all this out, saying, I can't imagine Manhattan ever adopting masks. Um, a friend of mine said, you could be wrong. Just think what happened with bike helmets and ski helmets in Western culture in quite a short space of time and how attitudes changed. Turned out I was totally wrong. And today masks are absolutely a social norm in Manhattan. Um, and yet I suspect once again, the main value efficacy is the fact that they actually act as a cultural signaling device as much as physically stopping germs. Again, to labor the point again, none of that could be picked up just by medical or data science. It requires really the magic combination of all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we experienced a, a great example sort of related to that through the pandemic with the entire natural cleaning, um, sustainable cleaning movement, which was in full force in 2019. And, you know, Every organization that was in that space was distracted by people's short-term behaviors, uh, especially in 2020. Uh, suddenly, you know, um, wipes with every chemical imaginable to, to humankind were flying off the shelves and they were unavailable and people were selling them uh, for a massive margin on uh, Etsy and what have you. Uh, and I think uh, there was a lot of distraction and our job in 2020, I, I was telling um, uh, the chief technology officer of, of one of our client companies a couple of days ago that I think our job in 2020 was primarily to keep the train on the tracks with, with most of the companies we work with in the sense that by studying meaning, we were able to either in many cases help organizations realize that the behavior you're seeing exhibited today uh, are purely behaviors in survival mode. We're not seeing the meanings change drastically enough for you to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Or in other cases, the meanings are transforming or changing because of the pandemic and you need a pivot in your strategy. Uh, natural cleaning is one of those spaces where we have consistently seen that despite what the sales data may show in 2020, the world will reemerge with an even greater appreciation for the natural cleaning landscape and the requirements, in fact, of what is considered to be natural cleaning uh, will increase because uh, consumers through this pandemic have actually grown their knowledge about the types of chemicals that are used in household products have actually become more knowledgeable. And we always see this knowledge comes before uh, meaning and some sort of knowledge develops and then it translates into a new set of meanings. And this is what's interesting. And, and of course there are cases where the opposite has happened but 
I think what's interesting to us is that uh, anytime there's something significant, um, you know, in, in culture where the behavior of the consumer changes, uh, as human beings, I mean, we, we all have this fight or flight mentality. And, you know, part of that applies to our jobs as well. And uh, I think the, the role of uh, anthropology is really in, in, in many cases, keeping the train on the tracks to help us understand and look at the long view, or in other cases, realize that, okay, we do need to change tracks and, and take a revised approach. Well, I think the role of anthropology above all else is just to go back to that fish can't see water point yeah. and to simply step back and see what you're missing and the questions you don't ask. Um, and it's kind of ironic because we live in a world of growing noise. You know, we have constant, constant noise distraction. And most of the really important stuff that people really care about, so the, the most really important stuff that allows patterns to be reproduced over time come from silences and the stuff that people don't talk about. Um, one other example I love, which I also talk about in my book, is in relation to um, laundry. Um, there was a big consumer goods company went around, did lots of surveys a few years ago asking women and in those days they just focused on women um why they what they thought about laundry and pretty much all these women said they hated doing it you know hate doing the laundry total chore and then they asked them well would you give it up to somebody else um and most of them and i wouldn't be one of these i'm happily giving the laundry up to somebody else but many of them said no i don't want to and the company the anthropologist dug into it and realized that for many women and again, I excuse the sexist language because this was framed by the company itself. Um, you know, doing laundry was something that was seen as part of their point of pride in terms of creating their domestic unit and sense of domestic identity. Um, and then they tried to work out why that was. Was it because there was some kind of massive competition going on as to who could have the whitest shirt? And if you look back at laundry advertising over the last few decades, it used to be always presented in terms of just how white can your shirt be? So it was basically about the science again. And then they realized actually what people really were talking about when they liked the laundry um, was this feeling of putting clothes into the, the washing machine and remembering all the stuff their kids and their families had done together. It was about a celebration of social relationships. You know, It was about putting your little Johnny's soccer shorts into the, laundry, into the washer and remembering the goals he scored with all the mud on it. So it was really about the kind of physical experience of recreating family bonds and celebrating that. Um, and that's a kind of interesting insight again, which is not easily articulated by consumers because you know we're not aware of that ourselves half the time, but at the same time is um, very important. And the one other tiny example I'll say is, is um, okay, one of my favorite examples it comes from the story of Cambridge Analytica, um, which of course is wildly controversial. And I tell that at great length in my book because of course, you know, they are a big data science um, horror story in the eyes of many, but also very interesting. And Cambridge Analytica, as you may know, built many of its models based on Facebook likes. And they assumed that what people said they liked indicated personality, which it may do. But as one of Cambridge Analytica's own founders said, who later split from the company, if I like someone's hat on Facebook or online, I'm not necessarily liking the hat itself. And so if you build models based on the characteristic of that hat, you're gonna be misguided. I'm actually saying, I like the relationship I have with the person who's posted that picture of the hat. And you can't tell which of those two it is just from science. You probably need to talk to people as well. And again, this is coming back to the key point that you need to actually put things into context. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a brilliant example. And I, I, I think I might reuse that example uh, with a couple of clients because, you know, we, we often get asked, uh, you know, a similar question about what kind of data we look at. Um, and the answer always is we look at data from platforms where people can actually engage with one another in discourse. People can talk to one another. It's less interesting to us to see what people are liking and sharing because it's very difficult to understand and glean meaning from it. At least the technology we have today is not, um, is not smart enough to do that. 
if I can put it that way. And, you know, the example you gave is so relevant because, you know, I was just, as you were describing that example, I was thinking of an example of, of some, somebody's kitchen I liked uh, yesterday on Instagram. They just moved into a new home in, in London and I liked their pic, the picture. Did I, does that mean I love the design of the kitchen? No. <laughs> well, that proves the point, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't to my taste. But to your point, I, I liked my relationship with this person. I'm looking forward to seeing them in London, hopefully sometime soon, because usually we see each other once a year around this time. Uh, and th so th there's just no way for us to know that. Um, the only way we can know that is if, you know, I was in a forum somewhere talking about being vulnerable, talking about the fact that I miss seeing my friends through this pandemic and I feel lonely and I'm unable to travel and traveling is a huge part of our family's life and blah, blah, blah. That's what's interesting to me is, is the distinction between that. Um, and I know, you know, this is obviously hugely controversial philosophy, but uh, I, I forget who it was that said that, but one of the things that started the whole early structuralist movement was this was this idea that um, if you can't talk about something, it probably doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, I, I remember um, having a debate with somebody about this and they said, well, how would you describe, you know, what about, you know, feelings of love towards somebody or an animal? Uh, you can't always describe that. And, you know, I, 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 my response to them was, well, you just did. You may not be able to perfectly describe it, but you just used the word love. You described a relationship between two human beings or an animal and a human being or what have you. Uh, and I think that's interesting. It's not perfect. And to your earlier point, uh, at no point do we ever raise our hands and say, this is the only thing you should be doing. Uh, but it's always about saying, this is an important part of the equation that we have ignored for far too long. And in fact, when you start paying attention, not only do you become more empathetic towards the world around you, you, I think you start to understand the modern world a little bit better as well, especially the parts of the world that you may not personally agree with. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's fascinating is that, you know, groups like Cambridge Analytica went out and sold the so-called ocean model based on Facebook likes, um, you know, and there are lots of, you know, big data companies doing that today. I mean, you know, probably I dare say the kitchen that you liked um, on Facebook, that like has gone into a model somewhere yeah. and is helping the kitchen maker to assume that there is a huge amount of enthusiasm for that particular kitchen yeah. design all over the place. And I'm not saying that's, you know, necessarily entirely wrong. You know, it's, it's a tool that can be used very usefully um, in some context, but it comes back to the compass analogy. You need to understand the context. Or another way of looking at this is, um, again, to go back to this um, Cambridge co-founder, a guy called Nigel Oakes, um, who did work with Alexander Nix in developing the company initially, but then split off to create his own, or rather to maintain his own operation. And was always very, very wary of a lot of the big data stuff. Um, that, you know, so much of the direction of consumer research and business analysis in the last few decades have been focused on the individual as a sort of self-standing unit of choice. So we have rational economics, individuals make choices as actors within the economic model. We have individual consumers who choose what they're gonna buy. And the focus consequently has been very much on things like psychology to get inside the heads of individual consumers. And again, all of that's valuable, but the reality is that we're group individuals interacting. So individual data points on behavior are helpful, but in the case of the liking the hat or not, you have to know the social context and relationships. Yeah. And so many of our choices as consumers are shaped by group patterns which can't just be captured by individual psychology. Yeah, I, you know, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think the interesting thing about uh, this entire shift is um, that more and more we're able to have a conversation about what, what AI really means in and of itself as well. Because there, there's either this perception that uh, technology will replace human beings, or there's this perception that technology is the be it end all. And I think um, what the modern world is allowing 
uh, room for at least for at least for organizations like ours and and for the types of people that work with us uh, is it's allowing room for us to have these conversations and to not take everything from sort of from a um, black and white perspective, but to understand that there is there are certain things that certain technologies, certain methods are good for and um, uh, and we need to adapt to the changing environment and what we need is the right tools and techniques to to be able to adapt in the right way. Um, Jillian, one of the things that I, I would love to um, uh, talk briefly about uh, is um, you know, I think part of that you, you cover in, in, in your book as well uh, is how uh, organizations may be thinking about uh, the work they do uh, and the industries they play within its, in and of itself. So, you know, as an example, I, and, and pardon me, I'm paraphrasing, but I think you talk, for example, about the etymology of a bank or the etymology of company. And you ask the question, you know, if you think about what a bank is or what it has been in the past and what it's going to be in the future, um, you know, where do you stand uh, in relation to that? How many times, uh, you know, over the last decade, have you taken a step back to think about what is it that you do and whether um, your definition, your idea of what you do actually marries with uh, the consumer, the people's idea of what you do. Um, and, you know, more and more so we see, every time we ask this question, more and more so we see such a fundamental disconnect between, um, you know, for example, what a food company thinks it does versus how the consumer uh, looks at food companies. Uh, and so on. So I, I would love to talk uh, briefly about this as well before we run out of time, because I, I, I'm sure I could spend uh, eight hours a day just chatting with you. But uh, this is one topic that I had on my list that I would, I would love to briefly unpack with you as well. Well, I, I love the fact that if you look at what where the root of the word company comes from, it actually comes from the old Italian compagno, meaning to break bread. Because originally companies were not balance sheets, they were groups of people who were gathering together to eat together and then do business. Um, you know, the roots of the word bank come from banca, meaning the benches that bankers used to sit in on in old fashioned Italian towns. And again, it's a relationship based function um, of, of commerce. Um, and I think that's interesting in two reasons. Firstly, it puts the premium, it reminds us all of the importance of looking inside these groups of people who are called companies and seeing how they interact. And there's a lot I write about in the book about how different tribes form inside companies, how they often clash, and often clash about the things that people don't even realize, talking about contradictory layers of meaning. I mean, the word meeting um, means completely different things to different people. Um, there's a wonderful anthropologist who spent a lot of time in General Motors looking at this and looking at why General Motors projects kept going wrong. And they kept calling meetings to try and resolve these problems and without realizing that each group of people coming to the meeting had entirely different expectations about what the word meeting meant and what it should actually do. Um, but it also affects how people see companies outside um, a particular enterprise and what people think companies are doing. And again, the stakeholder movement is such a clear indication of how societal attitudes have changed in a way that any executive with tunnel vision is in danger of being very slow to understand or appreciate. I mean, we saw this just last week with the whole issue of Georgia voting rights and the fact that many companies initially thought this, the corporate board thought, ooh, can't go there, can't get involved in politics. Um, and then suddenly realized that not only were their own investors demanding action, but their own employees inside the company were suddenly saying, how in a sec, we think you should get involved in company in politics. So the boundaries, if you like, this category collapse, the boundaries, these bounded models of what a company stands for are changing very fast. Um, so long winded way of saying that I agree. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, we, we had an interesting example recently where, um, you know, the, the board of a company that we work with decided to 
uh, ask the question. And I mean, I, th I think we were fortunate in the sense that they had done some analysis and have seen that the trust in uh, corporations in general, but also in their brands in particular is dwindling over the years. Uh, and so, you know, um, the next step was to ask the anthropologists, um, you know, how do consumers see a food company? What is the role of a food company in society? Um, you know, what are your expectations? What, what do you think um, uh, a food company should be delivering? What is their responsibility? And so, uh, you know, we had to examine the meaning of food company in a multitude of contexts in and of itself, as well as, for example, in the context of responsibility or in the context of a social contract that might exist in, in society. And lo and behold, we discover that in every single one of these examinations, not, there was not a single place, Jillian, where the consumer said, the role of the food company is to deliver uh, healthy, value, nutrition, all these aspects that are core tenets of the organization and how they think about their strategy as an organization and what they do. It's not how the consumer sees it at all. At all. Um, outside of sustenance, uh, a lot of the discourse is about a broken social contract. It, it, a lot of the discourse is about a worry of um, social justice or a lack of social justice, the treatment of people of color, communities of color, poor communities in the country. Uh, I think 2020 has been this watershed moment in culture where a lot of people, especially people who aren't people of color uh, and young have woken up to a new reality because they've been bombarded. Uh, and, I, I, and I believe largely for a good reason and it has had a good impact uh, but they have been bombarded with uh, new knowledge uh, that in the past they may have brushed off uh, as thinking not so relevant to me, but suddenly it has become relevant. And, and now, you know, when people think about the role of a food company, one of the questions asked is, well, what about social justice? What about uh, poor communities? What is the responsibility of a food company? We expect better and so on and so forth. And it, it, I think it was, it was a shocking moment for the board because our team got a chance to present to the board and there was utter and complete silence. It was just 30 minutes. We had to pack everything into 30 minutes. And I remember finishing that session, Jillian, and uh, Jason and I texted each other saying, either we've just upset everybody or we've done the best job ever. No one, <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> but you know, sure enough, the silence broke and it was for a good reason, but I think uh, we're so thankful that that organization asked that question in the first place. Right. I keep seeing all these questions popping up in the chat function. So I don't know whether um, you're supposed to pick them up or I'm supposed to pick them up or if Jason's around to do that. But um, yeah, and I, I think I think we've got 10 minutes to go. So maybe I'll ask Jason to jump in and, and see if uh, we should tackle some questions. Timing is absolutely immaculate. So uh, the first question uh, is really kind of going back to um, the laundry example that we discussed. Uh, and the question is really, how can uh, an anthropological insight approach be used when you're trying to help communicate or create a connection based on a meaning um, or the connection to things that the consumer doesn't really even consciously realize that they've ascribed to it. So how can we kind of be using anthropological insight in order to not only basically understand that there is something that needs to be done, but how can we build that bridge to actually communicating how we might be able to solve for that problem? Well, I mean, there, you know, this is somewhat beyond my bailiwick if you like, um, but you know, the first step is to basically engage in observation with, you know, act as if you're a Martian walking into that situation for the first time ever and trying to see absolutely everything. And the easiest trick to do that is to constantly try and think yourself out of the context you're in um, and into other contexts. So to come back to dog food, you know, you can't see how peculiar people's attitudes towards dog foods and dogs are um, in the Western world and how central they are to creating a family until you compare it to other cultures where dogs have a very different role. Um, in the case of laundry, um, you know, asking the questions, observing people, when, when, you, when they say in consumer polling, do you like doing laundry? No, I hate it. And then saying, well, do you want to give it up to someone else? No. And then try and say, okay, so, you know, why, why not? 
can't really explain it. And then you need to observe them actually putting the dirty clothes into the washing machine. And in this case, the insight came from actually talking to mothers um, and, you know, seeing them pick up these literally soccer shorts and talking, talking to the anthropologist about how Johnny had scored a goal on the soccer pitch. And they began to realize that that was one of the things that really mattered. Or, you know, picking up the bib of a baby and it, they'd chucked out their puree or something onto the bib. And seeing that these were actually memories embodied in, the, in that. And there's a very important concept of being embodied. Um, Simon Roberts, the anthropologist, pulled this out a lot. That basically, it's not just about brain and thinking. It's about smell, sight, touch. And smelling fresh laundry is very, very important. And then in this case, um, having sort of got these insights, what the consumer companies then did was to try and build that into their advertising campaign in a way that didn't present laundry powder as just a scientific experiment to try and make sure it's white, which is still around, but that's been the focus of so much advertising. They talked instead about families doing stuff with clean clothes. Um, and really celebrated that doing stuff with clean clothes and creating that family bond aspect. Um, and, and Julian, um, uh, I have a great example uh, related to this question as well, where you know you, you take the the skin tint product that was really built to save people time getting ready, um, mm -hmm. and it, and it was the the company in question was struggling to make this successful until they realized that the meaning association that was missing was one of skin health so they took the exact same product it was already a moisturizer it was a tint they rebranded it as a tinted moisturizer and lo and behold sales through the roof uh that's a good example of something um fairly simple where the meaning connection was just missing well, I mean, no one in Nestle, I mean, Nestle is not exactly the wildest, wackiest company in the world. Um, and nobody in the Swiss headquarters of Nestle, which owns Kit Kat, would have ever thought of trying to market a chocolate, brown chocolate bar as a prayer tool in Japan for teenagers. Um, and nobody, frankly, would have, you know, probably thought about, you know, chocolate had always been brown until um, some of the Japanese, and the Japanese started putting different colors into it. And now you have more than 200 different varieties of chocolate bar. And go back to your point about how meanings can change. One of the most interesting things of all about this is that eventually the bars in Japan, the chocolate bars in Japan became so innovative with so many local flavors like soy sauce and Hokkaido cheese and all the rest of it, that they came to be seen now as a symbol of Japanese-ness, not Britishness. And they're sold at Tokyo airport as a souvenir of Japanese culture. That's great. That's great. I'm going to totally jump on the segue that you've just provided me in regards to how meanings can change. So one of the questions that has presented itself is in the context of, can you, based on experience or what you've seen, provide some insight um, specifically in the context of how collective meanings are changing or how like the social imaginary or symbolism is shifting and changing? in the context of sustainability, most specifically in the context of kind of green finance. If you have any insight to share on that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this I, I, I could go on for hours about and I try not to, but basically point one, um, sustainability started off as an activist campaign, a group of people who wanted to actively change the world. Um, it was primarily championed very laudably by hardcore activists, um, whether they were you know, Scandinavian pension funds or, you know, in the financial business sphere or, you know, some, you know, wealthy trust fund kids who wanted to do good or, you know, true story, a large group of nuns who became activist nuns at shareholder meetings and were at the forefront of campaigning for ESG. Um, and it was very much called sort of, you know, sustainability, green finance, corporate social responsibility, socially responsible investing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then really two or three things happened. Firstly, it began to be rebranded, not as socially responsible investing, but environmental social governance. That term came out of the United Nations. Um, and that began to take on a life of its own. And environmental social governance sounds less threatening to many people 
than corporate responsibility or socially responsible inve investing. Um, secondly, what happened was that companies, as I said earlier, moved from seeing this as being just an activist tool to really being something which is much about self-defense and risk management. Um, people might say that's totally hypocritical. Um, many of the companies embracing ESG aren't doing it because they're true believers, like the Danish pension funds or the nuns. They're totally right. Um, I would argue, actually, that re revolutions happen not when a tiny minority of activists want to change the world, but when the silent majority gets swept along. And that's what's happening right now. People don't often admit that. Um, they often you know, like to pretend there's this illusion that the whole thing's about activism in green finance and um, ESG. But actually, self-defense is a very, I'd say, the overwhelming part of it right now. The third thing that's changed very subtly with the meanings is that it's gone from being something that you just put into a side pocket or department of your company, which was basically the do-gooding department, the kind of corporate social responsibility department, into being something which is really central to the operations of the company. And you can see that structurally in terms of how ESG departments are being organized. Um, An anthropologist spent a huge amount of time looking at the symbolism of office layouts and corporate structures and things like that. But you can also see that in the language and how things are being debated. Um, and the last point I'd make is that for companies, thinking about sustainability has gone from being something that is just done inside the company to actually their broader footprint across the entire corporate activity. So, you know, in environmental terms, people talk now obsessively about scope one, scope two, and scope three. And what that jargon means is do you measure your emissions inside your company? inside your suppliers or inside your customers too. And it comes back to this point I keep making about widening the lens. You know, tunnel vision is totally out of fashion. People can't articulate that, but certainly for the younger generation, it's about lateral vision. Um, none of those points are articulated when people talk about green, clearly, but they're very, very important. And the one other point I'd make, by the way, is I often joke to my colleagues that it really should be about olive, not green, in the sense of a muddy mix of brown and green. Because people used to think that when it was about activism, there was a clear cut green stuff, black stuff. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg still talks like that and bless her for basically putting this on the agenda. The reality is that most of us are living olives lives, whereas a mixture of green, brown, black, etc. And I think there's a growing appreciation of that olive yield curve, which again is coming in. But that, none of that's discussed with a normal framework of green movement. Right. Incredible. Well, uh, we are already at time. Uh, Jillian, thank you so very Sorry. much. This was wonderful. Uh, it is uh, you know, always um, a pleasure to speak to uh, folks that um, are living this reality, living in this world, uh, and uh, you know, taking the learnings, the the insight from uh, anthropological thinking, and applying that to uh, various fields. So it was a pleasure not just to get to know you, but also to do this session with you. Thank you so very much. I'm sure our attendees. Uh, uh, also really appreciate that. I, I've been seeing a, a barrage of, of messages and notes. Um, uh, really, really appreciating uh, having you on this. So thank you again. Thank you for all our attendees. Um, we will be back again next month with another Fireside Chat series. In the meantime, look out for Jillian's book, Anthrovision. When does it come out? It comes out in June. This is it. Um, although the Canadian version may be looking a bit different. Um, and very best of luck. And I'd like to just give you guys a big shout out for all you're doing, for putting your center stage and trying to just persuade all types of companies and policymakers to just look up beyond their compass and put that in context because it's very badly needed. So well Thank done. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.